some of you may remember that I talked about these exact same readings only three months ago, around the middle of November. You may remember that. Now, this is actually part of how the, the Roman one-year lectionary works. That whenever, in a year that has, that has more than 24 Sundays after Pentecost, any readings, there will be less than six Sundays read after Epiphany. So any readings from the remaining Sundays that weren't read after Epiphany are transferred over. This year, you're getting it in its proper place, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. It's kind of weird. It does take some getting used to, but that's how the one-year lectionary works. So what happens is no Sundays are subtracted. You get all the readings of a yearly cycle within that a given year. The three-year lectionary, you can actually lose, lose anywhere from what was like two to eight. I'm not sure, but there are some that are cut because from Epiphany they count forward. After Pentecost, they count backwards. So you lose some in the middle. Well, we don't lose any here. But there's another thing that I really like about this. That with the one-year lectionary, when you're, when you're using the same readings over and over again, especially when you're talking to the same group of people, it gives you a chance to enter the text from another angle or to go deeper into the text. I know I'm drawing this out. I promise I'll get to the point shortly. But it gives a chance to go deeper into the text that we can actually mine more out of it and see what is the sacred writer really telling us and on how deep of a level can we really go. Rather than just, you hear something, you might hear it again three years later, you might not hear it, and by then you've already forgotten about it, so going in on a deeper level just isn't an option. So, I'm going to pick up where I left off last year. So last year I mentioned that the antidote to fear is confidence. Now, what I didn't talk about is, where does fear get us, and where does confidence get us? Are there good and bad uses for each? And how does each of us assist us in our spirituality? So I'm going to begin by saying, what is fear? Okay. Okay, Jen says, testing, having trouble with reception here. Yeah, I know that the, I know that the phone's hooked into my wireless, and the upload right here, it's terrible. It's, long story short, I think one of the towers is pointing in the opposite direction. So if it's happening at my end, I apologize for that. If it's not happening at my end, I have no idea what to do. Okay, so what is fear? On a superficial level, fear is getting up in the morning and saying, Oh God, please don't let me die today. Tomorrow would be so much better. We can all associate that with cowardice. We can all associate that with being too scared to get out of bed in the morning because you're afraid of what's going to happen to you. But let's go on a deeper level. There's a thing that's called, okay, there's a thing that's called irrational fear, which is when you don't know what the cause of your fear is. A lot of phobias are based on irrational fear. Just being afraid of being around people when you weren't, maybe you weren't abused as a child, you weren't bullied at school, but you're afraid to be around people nonetheless. That's an irrational fear. Rational fear, on the other hand, is when you know the reason. If somebody's pointing a, pointing a gun at your head, that is rational fear. Because you may lose your life and you know exactly why. But what is the cause, the root of all fear, as it were? The root of all fear is a lack of knowing. Even in the example of rational fear, this guy's pointing a gun at your head. You're afraid that he may take your life. You don't know that he will take your life. And of course, there's also fear when your life will be taken. But a big cause for fear is lack of knowledge. It's often said humans fear the things we don't understand. And then we turn around and hate the things that we fear. That right there, I think, is an important thing. It's important to human makeup. It's an important part of human history. In fact, that fear is what motivates a lot of the social conflict we have right now. One side may fear the other side or fear what the other side may do. One side may be afraid for what's going to happen to them personally. 
we have all that lack of knowledge, all that lack of fear, and we've become so polarized, we refuse to talk to one another. We refuse to actually to sit down and share ideas and learn what makes the other side tick. We've become religious in our division. And the near future only looks like we're going to become more so. Does that help us? Does it help any of us? No. Now, it helps you if you're in a position of power and want to protect that power. It really helps. Microsoft actually has a word, has a phrase for that. FUD. F-U-D. Fear, uncertainty, doubt. Create FUD about competing products. And that motivates people not to buy the competition. In fact, I think I've documented quite well with the first chapter of Magic of Catholicism and Is Magic Wrong? that the institutional church works very well with FUD when it comes to alternate forms of spirituality. Fear, uncertainty, doubt. Am I going to go to hell if I, if I, if I practice magic? Am I, going to, am I going to have demons possess me if I practice magic? Am I going to turn against friends and family? I don't know if that's an objection, but I'm sure somewhere it is. If demons turn to get, uh, occupy you, you'll turn against friends and family. But the person's fear and the insistence that people be ignorant as per the rules drawn up after the 25th session of the Council of Trent. It keeps people afraid. There is even fear. How do I want to say this? Because I'm not sure where I'm going with this. There is even fear that if we don't do exactly what is told, something I call the big lie, we will never get ahead anywhere in life. Okay, Leonardo asks, is the connection really bad? Just here buffering all the time. Okay, it may, I, I don't know what's going on. It could just be a bad connection where I am locally. So I do, apolo I do apologize for that. I'm hoping that the video, when I download it and put up on YouTube, works out a bit better. Okay. We have this fear that if we don't do what we are told, we won't get ahead in life. I.e., we won't be able to even provide so much as a livable life for ourselves our, and our families, let alone leave anything on to those who come after. What, are, what is the big lie, you might ask? The big lie is go to school, get good grades, go to college, graduate, and you'll get a good job. Or go to school get good grades, and, f and find a factory job that can take care of you. Now, 30 years ago, a factory job was a good option. I know this right here. Okay, I live in what used to be a GM town. I live in what used to be a GM town. And here's the thing. You could drop out of school. You could go work for GM and make $20 an hour. $20 an hour in 1980s money is really, really good. I mean, it was awesome. And so you had people here, they had nice homes, they had nice cars, and then they had a high school education. Well, that fell apart. The, that fell apart. GM moved out, the bottom fell out from under the town's economy, and well, they're, stu they're still struggling. I mean, they're, they're still struggling to make something out of the aftermath. And then you have people that go to college and they get a job in the professions. Yeah, you might have a nice cushy job as a doctor or a lawyer. Actually, I wouldn't call those jobs cushy because you're faced with a lot of risk in those professions. You might have a nice cushy job in the professions, but you're so straddled with student debt that how much do you are you really able to enjoy when you're constantly kicking your paycheck to the debt? So what happens in both cases, what happens is a form of servitude. But it's motivated by fear. It's motivated by fear, and it's motivated by the fact that most people who try to make it on their own simply don't make it because they didn't know all the keys that were in play. They didn't know all the aspects of making it on your own. So fear keeps people in line. If I were to say anything to you, it's to learn how not to be afraid. It's to learn how not to straddle the party line, to learn how not to do just what you're told. Now, sometimes what you're told has a good reason. Like when somebody tells you don't touch a hot stove, there's a good reason for that. But when somebody tells you 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 have to wear, you have to wear say red socks, otherwise God's going to strike you down with a lightning bolt and send you to hell, there's no good reason for that. That's just to control you into wearing red socks and just buying red buying more red socks whenever yours get all ripped up and holy and stuff. 
Okay, am I rambling yet? I think I'm rambling. But that's fear, the lack of knowledge. We overcome fear by learning. Kathy says, I think with it being Super Bowl Sunday, everyone is crowding the internet. You know, I really don't even care about the Super Bowl. Actually, scratch that. I care enough about the Super Bowl to tell you I don't care about the Super Bowl. Other than that, I don't care about the Super Bowl. But moving back on. So if fear is the lack of knowledge, then we learn to overcome fear by getting knowledge. In the example of the big lie I told you, the first way to overcome that fear that keeps people obeying the big lie, i.e. what I call the employee mindset, and I think there are a few other authors who call it that too, it's to read everything you can get your hands on about entrepreneurship. Read everything you can get your hands on about what it takes to start out on your own. I know the Foundation for Economic Education, they have a free entrepreneurship course. Okay, they have a free entrepreneurship course. Take the modules. There's another place online that has an alter alternative MBA course where they tell you what the textbooks are. They tell you what podcasts to listen to. They actually give you exercises. Like one exercise is you read Dale Carnegie's How, How, to, How to Make Friends and Influence People. And then you go out, go out and practice talking to strangers every day. You put it into practice. And so these are the kind of things to do. And you don't need a college degree in order to, in order to, to make it, to go out there and make it. Bill Gates didn't have a college degree. Steve Jobs didn't have a college degree. Granted, they were also right at the ground floor of a paradigm shift, shift and in the right place at the right time. Bill Gates himself even admitted that in a magazine interview I read 15 years ago. But all around you, there is opportunity. All around you, there are ways to get out from under fear. Let me give you a minor example. Recently, I've been having problems with my car. Now, if you remember from two years ago, I was constantly having problems with cars. Right, I get, I get a vehicle, then like a, one, a week later, I lost a head gasket. It was beautiful. It, it, was, it was beautiful, and a week later, the head gasket go, goes out. I'm driving from Columbus to Dayton. Well, I also had a problem with the hot water heater. There was a problem with the plumbing. Because this was all liquid-based, I, I was afraid of water spirit after my house. Well, that was wrong. What ended up happening is there was somebody I was doing business with in, in real life. It turns out this person and certain people associated with this person were toxic. The moment I stopped having anything to do with this person on a business level, all of those problems just went away automatically. But that's not the example I'm telling you about. I just want to let you know that all those issues I mentioned in the past, they, they got resolved. I found out what the cause was. Okay. The issue as it is. Because back then I was looking for, I thought maybe a water spirit happened, but I wasn't picking up on anything. But the issue is right now is basic wear and tear on a car. Okay, fine. I lost. Okay, fine. I've got to replace, I've got to replace, I think I've got a cracked O-ring around one of the fuel injectors. That's the same amount of work, so when the time comes, I'll replace all the fuel injectors and all the O-rings. And I've got to replace the front right wheel bearing. Fortunately, on, on this particular car, it's an easier task than it is on most. Because all the bolts, they're up in front. You don't have to go in back or do any weird stuff with the steering knuckle or the outer tie rod. Okay, fine. However, it's either too cold or too wet or too snowing, and I don't have a garage to do this. So I've been worried, can I make this through the winter? Can I make this to warm weather? I was actually afraid because of uncertainty with the weather. So I did some magical work. Okay, please make this car last long enough to the spring. That was the intention. Make it last long enough so I can fix it. All right. Well, what ended up happening, and this was last Sunday, right before last Sunday's broadcast, I get this phone call. I, manif I manifested a new SUV for free. Actually, it was, deliver it was delivered yesterday. The only real issue with it is that the brakes are a little, a little bit spongy. I'm going to take it into the shop on Wednesday to have it lo looked at because I don't know how to work on this model. That's the only issue. I, found, I have found it's a, common, it's a common issue with this particular model. So, okay, fine. I'll get it diagnosed. If it's something I can do, fine. If it's something the shop has to do, I'll be careful and save my pennies. But here's the thing. I had the fear, 
I had the lack of knowledge of whether I could make it. I did the work, and the work manifested a new vehicle. How awesome is that? And what happened with this is the switch over from fear to confidence. Confidence is knowing that you can. Now, I'm currently reading Herb Cohen's You Can Negotiate Anything. This was a serendipitous find. I found it at a used bookstore for a dollar on the clearance shelf, and they had a 20% off sale that, that particular weekend. So I'm reading through it, and he's talking about the things needed for a, a negotiation. Power, time constraints, and information. The things that can determine a negotiation. It's very similar to Sun Tzu's talk about the five conditions that determine victory on the battlefield. And one thing he says about power is, power is what you believe you have. Many people have more power than they think they do, but because they don't believe they have power in this negotiation, they don't have it. Now, there's a flip side of that where people think they have more than they think they do. It's a corollary to what psychologists call the Dunning-Kruger effect. If you've ever watched King of the Hill, look at Peggy Hill. She's like the personification of Dunning-Kruger. Look no further than that for an explanation. So it is possible to be overconfident, but to have... But to have a realistic assessment of what you have and what you don't have is the best way to gaining power in your situation. Now, whether we're talking negotiation with other people, whether we're talking your actual life, the antidote to fear is confidence. And the acquisition of confidence is the appraisal of your power and the power that is at your disposal. In this case, it was the power of God to help me through this winter and get my car fixed. That is a very minor example. Extremely minor. Super minuscule. But it's certainly better than standing up there and freaking out that I may not be able to make it through the winter. That I may, that I may have to deal with potential sub-zero temperatures Having, having, to, having, to walk, having to walk out there and all that other kind of stuff, which I really hope nobody is suffering right now. People in Florida, stop laughing. I know, you've, I know you get hypothermia at 50 degrees. I have a friend whose parents moved down there, and he brags about it every chance he gets, so that's directed towards him. Okay, so how do you develop confidence? How do you develop power? It begins by developing knowledge, the same steps to overcoming fear. And then it continues by applying knowledge. And I see somebody in Florida just gave a laugh react. Love you too, dude. Okay. Acquiring knowledge and applying knowledge. That is the definition of power. Everything that I talk about in the magic of Catholicism, for example, it gears towards tapping into a power source. And power does not, mean, does not just mean what you have inside of you the energy you caught inside of you. In fact, an overly spiritual conception of power is just as bad as an overly physical conception of power because you need both in proper balance and in lockstep formation or lockstep-ish formation. You can veer one way or the other a little bit, but not too much. You have to balance the physical and the spiritual because as above, so below, as below, so above. In fact, that's even in Hebrews chapter 9. It's kind of cryptic in there, but it is in there. Let me know when you find it. You see, we plug into a power source. Those, with the spirit, those working on a spirit model will acknowledge that the power source is God. Any traditional grimoire magician will definitely tell you the power source is God. That's the power source we tap into. The prime mover who moves everything. In fact... The formless matter, the hyle, as the earth was void and formless and the spirit moved upon the deep. Okay, that's the hyle, the formless matter out of which the universe was created. You access that formless matter. Okay, when we are doing work, El Fosley may tell us about the astral light and various authors may talk the same. But what we're doing is we're either reaching up to that formless matter and giving it form to manifest here below. Or we are reaching up and asking God or his emissaries and so forth, to reach out to that formless matter and manifest it here below. And everything that I have talked about in my books, in these talks, is geared towards helping to empower you to move that formless matter and to manifest it. 
That's what it's geared towards. It's geared towards that. It's geared towards helping you to build confidence in your spiritual relationship and by consequence in your physical relationships. By physical, I'm referring to any relation you have with other human beings, period. With other human beings, with your pets, with, with all of physical creation. So please, don't take the term physical relationship to mean something that it doesn't. So we build confidence by building knowledge, developing power, applying knowledge. Now, the first time I ever did a magical operation, I told you about it. I was afraid that it wouldn't work. And I was, I was trying to help somebody who was in an abusive relationship. I was trying to help her get out. Not only was it an abusive relationship, it was also statutory rape. She was 16, he was 21. I was trying to help her get out, get out of that relationship. After I did the right, I felt something in the back of my head. It was like, it's hard to describe. I call it the release of knowing. I felt something in the back of my head, but it felt like I knew, I knew it happened. I know this happens. I know this happens. It's really hard to describe. But if, if you've experienced it, you'll know what I'm talking about. But I was, in, I was not confident, but two weeks later, I found out it was true. I found that the magic worked, and I gained confidence in the magic. Then I learned how to tweak it. Jen, I think you once said on my Facebook, you're a mage, you'll figure out how to make the magic work for you. And Jen also says, like cogs in a wheel falling into place. Absolutely. Like the blog post where I talked about the car accident 10 years ago. It actually felt like I was seeing the gear wheels of the universe. That's the only phraseology I can give it. It felt like I was reaching out and turning the gear wheels of the universe to shift things into my favor. And yes, the cogs fell into place. Likewise, the pieces in a puzzle. It's, and that's what happened. With, with that, I gained confidence and I lost fear. However, I lacked all knowledge about how to make anything work on the physical. And so what happened was, after, after the IRS basically, basically caused me to lose my job by shutting down the place where I worked. Okay, okay I think I told you that the crooked, about the crooked accountant that, was found out, that the IRS found out about like three, four years after he was gone. Well, what happened was, I lost my job over it. I was floundering. The job market wasn't too, wasn't too great. I was floundering. And so what ended up happening was, I was at the brokest point I was in my life. It took me five years to learn that while well, you can do all the magic you want, you have to do the work on the physical to mirror the magic that you're doing. You have to create gateways for the magic to manifest. This is what's called the sphere of availability. Knowing your sphere of availability is also a big confidence builder. Now, Robert Kiyosaki refers to this as your means. But rather than live within your means, you should work to expand your means. Okay, that's a secular application of the sphere of availability. It originally comes from Edward C. Peach, who wrote under Afiel in his Art and Practice of Creative Visualization, that a thing is not available to you unless either you can use it or somehow you were able to manifest, or somehow you were able to manifest it, or it has a channel to manifest into your life. Okay, one of those three things. I'm, I, I will define it as a thing is not available to you magically unless you have some channel, some non-magical channel by which to manifest it into your life. In the case of the SUV that I got yesterday, okay, my friend Sylvan, my friend Sylvan, it turned out my friend Sylvan's cousin was, look, was looking to part with one. She, she had an extra one. She was tired of having two vehicles, having to pay insurance and license fees and all that on two vehicles. So she was looking to get rid of this. So what happened was, this hole opened in my sphere of availability and made this vehicle available to me. That's what that was. I would never have thought this would be in my sphere. But analyze your sphere anyway before doing magical work. Analyze your sphere so you know what to manifest. Also, are you able to use this thing you're looking to manifest? I know in the Magic of Effective Prayer, I think I used the example of a person with no, no business background who wants to be CEO of a Fortune 500 company. 
Well, if you have no business background, no leadership background, and no finance background, what's going to happen is suppose you get the job CEO of a Fortune 500 company. What ends up happening is you'll most likely run the company into the ground. You'll run the company into the ground. Who knows how many people will be left without a job, without a way to support their family. So you disrupted their lives trying to get your goal. And you yourself are going to be broke again because you ran the company into the ground. You'd be worse off than if you'd never had the job to begin with. And so when you examine your store of availability, you have to ask, can I actually use, do I know what I'm doing with this thing that I'm asking for? Along with, is there a channel where this is, is available to me? Now, is there a channel where it's available? If you do the work, you do the magical work, what happens is, if there, if there is a channel available that you don't know about, like with what happened with me yesterday, if that channel is available, then God will make it clear and actually put like a shine a light bulb on that channel. But go with what you know starting out and follow what and follow what indications you get later as you're doing the work. But you gotta start somewhere, start with what you know. Todd says, learning what to ask for. Yes, very much. Okay. Now another thing in the in the in the sphere of availability. Okay, so knowing what to ask for, and also work to expand your sphere of availability. Just as Kiyosaki says work to expand your means, I say work to expand your sphere. Because it's, it's never static. It's either expanding or contracting. Okay, as people come and go in, in your life, your sphere expands or contracts, for example. Or as you make moves in your life, your sphere expands or contracts. Expand it by expanding your knowledge. For example, to use the example of the guy who wanted to be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, start by learning about start by learning about finance, your own personal finances first. Then work on learning about entrepreneurship. Work simultaneously on entrepreneurship and the type of business that you want to be in. Learn how that business works. Learn everything you can about the product or the service, about, about the, who your customers would be. Learn everything you can about what kind of things they would ask for. Learn your people skills. That's also very important in leadership positions. Actually learn. Go on the internet, even if your only access is at the library. Go on the internet. Go say to um, Allison or Coursera and look at the free classes they have to offer. Even if the classes are out of date, like their, their social media classes were out of date, they still refer to Facebook as having a wall, for example. But it still gives you a foundation, something to start working with. So start, start somewhere. Start with all the free classes on the internet. Listen to podcasts that people in the line of business you want to go into have. Actually start the business. Start the business. Expand the business. Work to expand it. And what's going to happen is, as you're expanding your sphere of availability, why would you want to work for somebody else's company anyway when you have your own successful enterprise? Why would you want that? So what happens is, expanding the sphere of availability, not only can it help you get the things you do ask for, it can help you get somewhere better than what you ask for. And that's important. I want to share that message with you. I want to share the message. Building your, building your knowledge, building your confidence, builds your power, expands your sphere, and eliminates fear. Okay, Jen says, I'm sitting on the precipice wondering if I can survive if I jump off. Please do not jump off. Please. That is like the complete opposite of everything we're talking about here. I am... I'm beyond, I'm beyond worse. Okay, my mother and grandmother were, were nurses in the VA system. Okay, as my mother was near... Okay, I don't want to make comparisons to your situation. Please don't think I'm making comparisons. But as, as my mother was reaching her 20 years, they did, every, they did everything they could to get her to quit. They did everything they could to get her to quit, and they made it really rough for her to be there. It was a nightmare scenario. But I really, really feel for, for, for I really feel for what's going on. What's going on? I am. I can't. I can't believe any company could legally get away with doing something like that. And I'm really, really sorry. But please, if you can stick it out, please, please stick it out. Please stick it out. Get it over and done with. I just. 
I just hope I I hope you can get it behind behind you as quickly as possible because I know it sucks. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read the comment because that's like my own brain goes to a really dark place when I read what was just typed. I understand. Okay, but I, I do I do want to move on. So once you expand your sphere, expand to the point where the things that you think you can't get right now, where the things you think you can't get right now become very easy to you. Where the things that you think are not in your reach become within your reach. And your sphere expands so it covers them too. At least for those of us who live in the first world, we do have clear paths to doing this. We have, at least for those of us who, who live in, in these in, in, in industrialized countries that basically fall under the category of liberal democracy, Okay, at least for those of us, we have opportunities. We have fewer we have fewer obstacles that are in our way. And so there is no reason for us to complain about these obstacles. And I'm not just again, I'm talking about finance and jobs and all because that's the number one thing people ask me about. That's the one that people ask me about that the most. So I'm answering what people ask me the most. But the same thing applies when doing work for your health, because the more you learn, okay, the more you learn. About the, about the human body or about your pet's bodies if you're working with them. The more you learn, I mean seriously learn from medical textbooks. I don't mean those, I don't mean those crappy websites that try to scare you with, God forbid, you, ha you have a tiny little bit of gluten in your system. I don't mean those websites. Or those websites that tell you you're going to lose all your testosterone if you drink bottled water from a plastic bottle. Okay. Those are just trying to sell you a product by fear. FUD. Remember when I said FUD earlier? Fear, uncertainty, doubt? That's an example of it. And a lot of natural, holistic health websites are examples of using fear to market a product. So you know, learn from actual medical textbooks. When my mother was in, was in nursing school, I actually, I actually did kind of swipe her textbooks and I read some of them. She had a, um, a, she had a research project and she chose domestic violence for it, so... I admit, I kind of read those of her more abnormal psych books the most. Okay, maybe that's why I ended up watching all those 90s era Lifetime movies at one time. Oh well. I'm not talking about that part of my life. Okay. So, moving forward. To do this is to overcome fear. To become proficient at what you do is to overcome fear. To have, an, uh, to have a clear, a clear idea of what obstacles are in your path and a clear plan for circumventing them or, or leveling them is going, is going to overcome fear. But you can also take the concept of empowerment too far. You can also take the concept of confidence too far. For example, Theophilus of the Locus of Aphiel channel recently put out a video about why do you need circles when doing evocation. Now, I myself have said that you are the circle, and to a point that's true, but when you are doing evocation, you need a circle. Contrary to what a lot of people in the more modern ma magic <coughs> scene say, and yes, if you use a case ball, I'm going to make fun of you. I'm going to make fun of you because you know what? It's what I do. You're welcome. All right. So a lot of people in the more modern scene say you don't need a, you don't need a circle. All you need to do is stare at a sigil and say the demon's game over. They talk about this for quote unquote demonic entities or cacodemonia. That's what they talk about. That's overconfidence in your own ability. That's over, that, that's overconfidence in your own ability to to ne to negotiate and deal with an entity that's been around for millions, if not billions, of years longer than you have that is incalculably smarter than you are, that is far more manipulative than any human could possibly be, and more charismatic and knows the right promises to make. Now, we can always recommend the screw tape letters for talking about how demons think and how demons deal with humans, but I, but you know what? I'm pretty sure even C.S. Lewis's imagination as wonderful as it may be, was still pale in comparison to that of the actual entities themselves. 
So yes, you do need to set up protections, and you need proper protections. The other issue with the modern magic scene is that they want to erase all, all reference to God. Whether we talk about, about the Adonai Echad, God of the Jews, or the Trinitarian God of the Christians, they want to erase all references to, to the Abrahamic God, to the source of all power, source of all being. So first off, they're saying no protection. Second, they're saying, saying no protection. Second, they're saying cut off the source yourself from the source of power that can protect you. Have trust in the magic and it, and it will lead you through. I want to give you an example of why that's an exercise in overconfidence. One person was, okay, there's this, excuse me, there's this modern type group that I lurked on for a while. I'm still lurking. The only reason, the only reason I haven't left yet is I want to find the one or two comments I made and delete them before I leave. But one big thing is like testimonials, like Protestant praise reports. You know how in Protestant church you have the praise report where somebody in the congregation will get up and say, what God did for me this week? Well, they do testimonials. Now, one person said, I was working with this book. I'm just going to call it the cash book right now. So as not to say what system this was. And the entity that they say to work with in this book brought, brought me money by saying, by the IRS, by the IRS making a, a, an error of 900, I forget the amount, I'm saying $900 in my favor, in my favor. Here's what happened. All right. So there was nothing in this person's sphere of availability. Nothing is availability. The IRS supposedly made a mistake. First off, I owed the IRS $900 more. And then I'm hearing that, they owe me, that I owe them $900 less. So how would error happen in their computer system? Sooner or later. Okay, fine. You're happy you got the money. You're celebrating you got that money. Guess what's going to happen? Sooner or later, the IRS is going to find that. And do you think they're going to let it slide? No. Anybody who's dealt with them will tell you they're not going to let it slide. They will come after this person. So what happened is this. I am grateful that this entity, that, that, that this entity that has no real foundation outside of some dude's imagination from 1974, this entity gave you the money. This entity who's probably a created egregore gave you the money, but got it to you from a really bad source. And another person, the bank's computer had an error where I had an extra 2,500 in my account. What happens there? The bank's gonna find out about it and gonna hurt you. So a lot of what this group was doing, they cut themselves off from the power source and then they're, then they're calling on entities that cannot be trusted they're not binding the entity not to screw them over, and the entity's screwing them over, and they're celebrating it. And what happens is, when the entity does screw them over, they're going to go and talk to this entity again, help me get out of this bind, and the entity's going to do that, and then put them in another bind. It's kind of like, what was it, Inside Edition did a, um, an expose on car bo on body shops, how someone would use a sledgehammer or to break in somebody's hood so they'd have a charge of fixing that too. It's a lot like that. The entity will create a revolving door so, so you end up going back to it again and again and again. Okay, Leonardo says, What do you think of subliminal messaging and law of attraction? Do you think you can use law of attraction to expand your circle of possibilities manifestation almost just by itself, or is this some new agey mumbo jumbo? Okay. I do think that Law of Attraction has something to it. One of these days, I'm going to write a book about it. Okay. I just don't have my thoughts completely in place for it. But I spent some time last summer reading as much Law of Attraction stuff as I could get my hands on. And I do think there's something to it. I do, insofar as I think that there's something to the psychological model. Because that's exactly what it's based on as a psychological model. I think there's something to it. However, I think that the way a lot of it is, um, a lot of it is employed is completely and totally false. I've seen, a, I've seen a lot of Law of Attraction teachers, like one, for example, who, said, who wrote this video, How I Got $40,000 in 48 Hours. And maybe this is why I'm using money as an example. Not just that most people ask me about it, but 
That is something that you see on Law of Attraction videos. So I'm going to answer this. How I got 40000 in 48 hours. Now you get, you get broke Joe Average who runs classes on YouTube. Okay, cool. I can learn how to do this. It turns out that she, that she had an established real estate business. That this was just something she did every day. And it was just a property she was selling that, okay, fine. She got the asking price for. Everything here was perfectly within her sphere. So, can Law of Attraction be used? Yes, it can help you with things that are already in your sphere of availability. Same deal as, same deal as the um, creative visualization or treasure charts or other, or other generally regarded as weak forms of magic. But can Law of Attraction take you from, from having nothing into being a multi-billionaire inside of 90 days like some of the books I've read claim? Absolutely not. You need to do the work yourself. You need to do the foundational work. Otherwise, no amount of attracting, no amount of subliminal suggestions, no amount of affirmation, no amount of burning candles, no amount of incense, no amount of prayer is going to do it for you. I think it was St. Benedict who said, Ora et labora, pray and work. And it was either St. Augustine or St. Ignatius of Loyola who said, that quote gets attributed both time, to both, we have to pray like it depends on God and work like it depends on us. And that's the seventh key of effective prayer. Ain't nothing to it but to do it. All right, jumping off from Law of Attraction, which I'm glad you asked the question because it really does tie in with everything we're talking about here. Okay, so while, while, we're, while we're jumping off from this, I think I've... I think I've hammered my point into the ground quite a bit. But not only is the opposite of fear confidence, also confidence is the key to empowerment, and empowerment is the key to the elimination of fear. So learn your options, people. Get past any emo emotional issue you have in a given situation. Get past any biases you have in a given situation. Prejudices, ideologies, religious doctrine even, if need be, get past it and look at the situation as clearly and as lucidly as possible and as realistically as possible. What you're going to find is that at least here in the first world, I can't speak for other countries because I don't live there, I don't know the situations there, but at least here in the first world, and there is no such thing as a situation and from which you cannot somehow grow or somehow advance yourself. There's no such thing as a situation that, that does not become an opportunity. And this is not just a material opportunity. I'm also talking about a spiritual opportunity. I'm talking about relationship opportunities. Opportunities in which you can learn for your health. Opportunities in which you can learn for your protection or to protect yourself from spiritual threats or from physical ones. Everything provides opportunity. I think Richard Bach and his illusion said, every problem has its gifts. We come to our problems because we need their gifts. Now, I'm not really too big on the New Agey thing either, but he's right in that sense. Every problem has a lesson, and every lesson can help us further. If something breaks down in my car, well, I, I told Alex my last glitch problem, if you, I'm not a mechanic, because I wasn't really following the analogy from the start of the engine that well. I was talking about the... Um, Oh, I kicked the tripod. Oops. Well, I was talking about the prayers at the foot of the altar and how it's like the engine, turning over an engine in, in, in the Latin Mass. But when something breaks down in my car, I learn about it. And if it's something I can fix, I, I can do most things. Engine work I don't do, but most things I can fix. If it's something I can fix, I fix it. I learn how to fix it. I fix it. And I, act, I have that knowledge for later on if the same problem happens. So the problem bears a gift. The gift bears knowledge. The knowledge bears empowerment once the knowledge is applied correctly. So if I were to ask you to do anything, it's apply yourself in the physical as well as the spiritual. Do not be afraid, whether it be of new, new problems or new political regimes, because even if you don't like somebody who's in charge, you can still find a way to benefit from their policies. 
So don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of what your opposition is going to tell you. Don't be afraid of what your peers are going to say if you decide to break away from their party line and do something on your own. I talked about the fear. In my interview with, Dave, with David Oliver Kling, I talked about the fear that I had of leaving the traditional movement, the fear of walking away from the truth, as I called it. The fear of walking away from this closed circle of idiots, of narrow-minded idiots who basically jerked off about seeing other people fall down. Okay, Theophilus says, much like how Platonists had an ascension they called purification. They would grow, and when a new problem arose, they would focus on it, and the problem was a form of initiation. Yes. I think that's exactly what I'm talking about. But in that, in that sense, we can even talk about the allegory of the cave. In the sense that unshackling from, or being released from the chains presented a problem. Like, how do you walk if you've never walked before? And then, seeing the different shades of light present new problems. So we can even see the root of that ascension purification inside the allegory. And what happened with me leaving the traditional movement was I was living the allegory of the cave. I was unshackled. I saw what was in the outside world. I didn't like everything I saw in the outside world, but I liked it a hell of a lot better than what I saw in the trad movement, the mentality that people had there. Someday I am going to do a video where I talk about that. I'm going to talk about everything that went down in, in some degree of detail. That day is not today. But I overcame the fear. And when I went out, and when I saw ministry grow, when I saw ministry actually being something needed, I developed confidence. I developed confidence. And my sphere grew larger. This was at the point where the church, Columbus Chapel of Faith Ministries, we had, we had one new person coming in every Sunday for about a year. Do you know how amazing that was? It's a shame that things didn't end up, ta end up taking a turn when, well, I lost my job, which is why I financed in the church, and then we, lo and we lost our location. I mean, things actually started going downhill fast then, but when you move a church location, you lose people. That's just what happens. But still, it was happening. I saw proof that it was working. This was the right decision. And now I'm not afraid of doing that again. I'm not afraid of going out again. Actually engaging people, engaging the world. I'm not, no need to stay inside of an echo chamber. And I think that right there is one of the most important things for overcoming fear. Move past what other people think. Move past their expectations. If they are not paying your bills or putting a roof over your head, then what they have to say does not matter to your life. Even if you love them dearly and you think you can't live without them, you can. And if you really do love them dearly, it may be better to live without them. If, you're direct, if your life is going in a direction that they simply cannot follow, and it would be nothing more than pain to them to try following in the same direction that you are. So it's not just your freedom, your confidence, and your empowerment that I'm talking about. It's the freedom, the confidence, and the empowerment of all of those who are around you as well. How would this play out for them if I keep them with me or if I stay inside of this circle? That's the other thing you had to think of. It's a maze of navigating the right decisions. But when you make those right decisions, whether you learn from trial and error, from your peers, or from mentorship, when you make those right decisions, it's just like Naomi Basada Pascale says, Okay, your old name was easier to pronounce, I'm sorry. But just like you say, overcoming fear is a huge thing. But once you get there, you are free. That is so true. Once you get there, you are free. Once you are out of the cave and you learn to see the sun as it is, not just the reflection in the pond, you are free. And then it's up to you to go back and help those who are not free. It's kind of like a perichoresis model. Once you move that lever and change things around, expand your sphere of availability, once you have grown, you are then in a position to help others grow.
But if you have not grown, then you are not in a position to help others grow because you can't do anything for them if you can't do anything for yourself. That is why I stress growth and empowerment so much. That's why I don't talk about empathy. I don't really talk about love beyond an intellectual perspective of understanding. I don't really use the word compassion that much because to me, true compassion, true love, true empathy comes from what you do after you grow and you're actually in a position to be empathic, to be compassionate, and to be loving. Until then, you do the best you can. But you have to expand. Otherwise, if you're not expanding, then first, you are wasting the gift that God gives you that gives you the opportunity to expand. And second, second, you are not being loving or compassionate or empathic towards your neighbor because you are choosing not to have anything to offer them. You are choosing not to have any service to render them. You are choosing not to develop the gift that God gave you. So you're wasting an opportunity from God and an opportunity from your neighbor. Why the hell would any believing Christian want to be that kind of wasteful towards the God that you claim to love or towards the neighbor you claim to care about? Get there. Be the person who can make the change. They say start by being the change that you want to see. Well, you have to make the change in yourself first. You have to be the change. You have to have this. And then get to the point where you can bring the change. And come to the point where you can bring the change, not by whining about it on Facebook and Twitter, and both sides do this. And does it get them anywhere? No. Okay, Jen says, it's amazing that the very topic of working a business, which is already partially started, came up in relation to fear. I've always been a nurse. But the place is closing and the situation is brutal. Sounds to me that you're kind of being, kind of being forced into this change. I, de I definitely want to talk to you about this in private. Okay, I'm probably I'm probably gonna message you at some point dur during the week. The rest of my the rest of my day is pretty booked up, but Jen, I definitely want to talk to you in private about this. And Todd says, "Love your neighbor as yourself requires you to love yourself first. Todd, that is why loving yourself is the second key of effective prayer, and loving your neighbor is the third, because it happens in that order. And Theophilus says. Change comes from people watching you, not people listening to you. That was a hard-learned lesson, but it's true. People, people care about examples. Like, right, people don't go, for example, with religion. Most people sitting in the pews, they don't go to religion for doctrine. They don't go to religion for the intellectual, the intellectual theology or any of that. They want the morality. They want to live their life. And they care about your example more than they care about your belief. And hang on a second. Can I scroll this down? All right, Clint Westwood says, there are two Clints, and Clint Westwood says, that was basically Augustine's view. Love is the highest virtue, but it has to be cultivated with the other virtues and to be built on them. If you jump into love without the foundation, prudent, courage, temperance, justice, I can pretty much complete the sentence. If you jump into love without the foundational virtues, you're going to fall flat on your face. Actually, the, actually I, I would think that the social gospel movement fell flat, flat on its face because of that, and it continues to falter because of that. They're taking the idea of love too far that they're not balancing it. They're not balancing it with liberty or courage or prudence or temperance or, just, or justice. They're not balancing it. Okay, and I just scroll up and find Clint says, you will end up a sucker. Bingo! And you will. So... If I, if I were going to close this out, if I were to go, going to close this out, I think I've said everything that need, needs to be said today. The antidote to fear is faith, how I first preached it. The antidote to fear is confidence, how I said it last year. And today, the place of confidence and empowerment in eradicating fear. Learn to eradicate your fears. Take an inventory of your situation. And I can't take that inventory for you because only you know your situation. 
take an inventory. Get it? Take an inventory of, of the people around you, of yourself, of the situation around you, and of what your options are. What your options are for improving your situation. Even if you're living really well, you have the love of your life at your side, you're in perfect health. Still, take an inventory of what opportunities are there for growth. What direction is there for growth? Take advantage of the opportunities presented to you. And even if you don't think you have something, pray that God will show you the opportunities and shine a light on your path. Pray for that. And as you pray, and as the opportunities are shown to you, do the work in accordance with those opportunities. Do the work. Within a year, then, come back to this in a year. When I'll be talking about this, I'll either be talking about this next February or again in November because of how this particular set of readings is weird throughout the year. But when we talk about this again, I will ask, I will ask you on camera, how have you fared in the past year? And I will hope to see a bunch of comments saying that you're doing so much better than you were, that you are so much more awesome than you thought you were. And that your life is awesome and your spiritual connection is awesome. Because without that spiritual connection, you don't have a foundation for anything to follow. 